Hello. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to be able to speak to you today. And to do so properly, I need to share my screen with my PowerPoint slides. Here they are. And let me make them full size and minimize my face. As you know, AI is very much in the news these days. And my topic today is about explainable and reliable AI and autonomous adaptive intelligence to discuss deep learning adaptive resonance and models of perception, emotion, and action. So, this lecture is based on the following article with a similar name that's published open access and is also on my webpage. It summarizes core problems of deep learning, such as its untrustworthiness because it's unexplainable and it's unreliable because it experiences catastrophic forgetting. The article explains how adaptive resonance overcomes them, indeed overcomes 17 problems of deep learning and outlines a blueprint for achieving autonomous adaptive intelligence. So the article was recently published in a special issue about explainable AI whose editors wrote, though deep learning is the main pillar of current AI techniques and is ubiquitous in basic science and real world applications, it is easy to fool and it also cannot explain how it makes a prediction or decision. In other words, deep learning is not trustworthy. No life or death decision, such as a medical or financial decision, can confidently be made using deep learning. Deep learning uses the backpropagation algorithm for how to predict output vectors in response to input vectors. Backpropagation was based upon perceptron learning principles that Frank Rosenblatt started introducing in the 1950s. It has quite a complicated history as Jürgen Schmidt Huber nicely reviews in an article this year. Its main contributors include Shinichi Amari, Paul Wervos, and David Parker. <coughs> Backpropagation reached its modern form with simulated applications in Paul Werbos's 1974 article and was then popularized by Rommel, Hutt, Hinton, and Williams 12 years later. Here is a schematic of the backpropagation circuit, uh, a figure printed from, from Gail Carpenter's 1989 review of neural networks. In it, information flows feed forward from input to the actual output. Learning is supervised because there's an external teacher who provides a target output on each trial. And the teaching signal is the error or mismatch between the actual and target outputs. But to get the teaching signal, which is computed in level F3, to change the adaptive weights in level F2, there's no network pathway whereby to reach F2. And so there's an artifice called weight transport in which one physically lifts these weights and transports them so that they can be used to learn. So this is both a non-local operation and a non-biological one. Moreover, learning is slow. The adaptive weights change just a little to reduce the error on each learning trial. Therefore, it requires many trials to learn often. You might need possibly hundreds or thousands of trials to learn a database. This is to be contrasted with fast learning, where adaptive weights can zero error signals on each trial. For example, you can learn a face that you see just once and remember it for a long time. Moreover, uh, backpropagation and deep learning are susceptible to catastrophic forgetting. During any learning trial, an unpredictable part of its learned memory can suddenly collapse. So because of this, deep learning is neither reliable 
nor trustworthy. Why is this? Well, all inputs are processed by a shared set of learned weights. The algorithm cannot selectively buffer learned weights that are still predictively useful. There's no attentional mechanism. This problem indeed occurs in any learning algorithm whose shared weight updates follow the gradient of the error in response to the current batch of data points while ignoring past batches. There have been multiple efforts to fix backpropagation to selectively slow learning, quote, on the weights important to supervised learning and reinforcement learning problems by optimizing parameters using Bayes' rule, as was suggested a few years ago. But this assumes an omniscient observer who can discover and alter only the important weights as well as non-local operations used in Bayesian computation. And the same problems occur where you try to augment backprop with evolutionary algorithms, with diffusion based neuromodulation, and so on. So these efforts to overcome catastrophic forgetting hereby created additional conceptual and computational problems. I view them as adding epicycles to ameliorate a fundamental flaw in the model which is reminiscent to me of adding epicycles to correct problems in the Ptolemaic model of the solar system. <coughs> and as we know, the Copernican model that supplanted it and that we now accept didn't require any epicycles. Perhaps this is why Jeffrey Hinton, who was a leader in the development of backprop and deep learning said in Axiom, Axios a few years ago, quote, He's deeply suspicious of backpropagation. I don't think it's how the brain works. We clearly don't need all the label data. My view is throw it all away and start over. Well, we don't need to have to start over because all of these problems were actually solved in the 1970s and 80s. In fact, in my paper in 1988, in the first issue of the journal Neural Networks, I listed 17 problems of backpropagation that were overcome by adaptive resonance. And here's that list. And if you think about, we don't need all the labeled data, the third item in that list was that adaptive resonance or art can overcome that problem using unsupervised learning. As to the problem of slow learning, that's overcome because art can run with fast learning or slow learning as you wish. In particular, art can learn to classify an entire database using fast learning on a single learning trial as Gail Carpenter and I showed in the 1980s. So art overcomes all 17 problems of backpropagation without epicycles. Moreover, and no less important, the core art predictions have been supported by psychological and neurobiological data. Indeed, art is a principal biological and technological theory, not just an algorithm. It's explained data from hundreds of experiments and it's made scores of predictions that have subsequently received experimental support. Well, why is art so successful? One reason can be traced to the fact that art can be derived from a thought experiment about a universal problem in error correction that I published in 1980 in Psychological Review. The thought experiment asks the question, how can a coding error be corrected if no individual cell knows that one has occurred? And let me quote from my article, the importance of this issue becomes clear when we realize that erroneous cues can be accidentally be incorporated into a code when our interactions with the environment are simple and will only become evident when our environmental expectations become more demanding. And even if our code perfectly matched a given environment, we would certainly make errors as the environment itself fluctuated. So R tries to solve the problem of autonomous local learning in a changing world. 
And so a purely logical inquiry into error correction is translated at every step of the thought experiment into processes learning autonomously in real time with only locally computed quantities. Moreover, the thought experiment uses familiar environmental facts about how we learn as its hypotheses to derive art and the art circuits naturally emerge from things that we all know because they're facts that are ubiquitous in our daily experience. Art circuits may thus in some form be embodied in all future autonomous adaptive intelligent devices, whether biological or artificial. And art has perhaps for this reason already been used in many large scale engineering applications. Well, very early on, there were successful art math benchmark studies, which is why art started to be used right away, whether against machine learning, back propagation, statistical methods, or genetic algorithms, art did better in accuracy and or training speed. And that led to many large scale applications in engineering and technology, some of which you can find at our Tech Lab website at BU, one of them being the Boeing Parts Design Retrieval System that was used to design the Boeing 777, which was a challenge because that inventory included 16 million, 1 million dimensional vectors and was continually growing. It's a non stationary parts in inventory, and one needed fast learning and stable memory to learn and search it. In terms of large scale problems like satellite remote sensing, Gail Carpenter showed in 1999 with her colleagues how art and art map system can learn a map from remote sensing data that blew an AI expert system out of the water. It took the AI system a year with very large site level uh, pixels. Art map did it a day. It didn't need any of these ad hoc rules, and it did it with an order of magnitude smaller pixels. Gail Carpenter went on to show how you can do information fusion in remote sensing, how even if you have multiple observers using different labels that are perhaps incomplete or inconsistent or even wrong, how you can get inconsistent knowledge from inconsistent data by automatically learning and stably storing one to many mappings, leading to Gill's demonstration of how you can self-organize a, a hierarchy of cognitive rules. And these rules also give you confidence measures in how uh, different categories predict higher, more abstract representations in the hierarchy. <coughs> there have been Many more recent applications of art, for example, in the special issue of Neural Networks in December 2019, Don Bunch, the uh, editor of that special issue, had an initial article where he summarized some of these developments. And then in a long article within the issue itself, they surveyed adaptive resonance theory, neural network models for engineering applications up to the present. So back propagation is a feed forward adaptive filter, but art is more than that. It's an explainable, self-organizing production system in a non-stationary world. It's self-organizing because it can autonomously carry out arbitrary combinations of unsupervised or supervised learning trials with the world as its only teacher. It's a production system because it uses hypothesis testing to discover and learn rules via a top-down matching process that focuses attention on critical feature patterns that predict behavioral success while suppressing irrelevant features. It's explainable using both of its activities or short-term memory STM traces and its adaptive weights or long-term memory or LTM traces. 
observing the STM traces in a critical feature pattern explain what the recognition categories code and what features predict all oriented actions. Moreover, the long term memory traces in fuzzy ArcMap translate into fuzzy if then rules that code what combinations of features in what numerical ranges control successful predictions. So here are some of the arc mechanisms that define it as an explainable self-organizing production system. It includes, of course, that it's a bottom-up filter as also as backdrop and deep learning, but that's supplemented by top-down learned expectations and two types of recurrent inhibitory feedback interactions that help to choose recognition categories and, <coughs> excuse me, the critical feature patterns. These top-down expectations use what I call the art matching rule to learn how to focus attention on critical features that code predictive success. The art matching rule embodies how the brain uh, does object attention and it helps to stabilize learning and thereby avoid catastrophic forgetting. It's realized by a top-down modulatory on-send off-surround network. So in particular, let's say you have bottom-up inputs activating feature detectors. So let's say nothing else is going on. Well, let's say you activate a category and it tries to read out and it's excitatory top-down learned prototype, but it can't fully activate the features because it also reads out a broader inhibitory of surround. And the excitation and inhibition are approximately balanced in the top-down mode. Now, if both bottom-up and top-down inputs converge, then within the prototype, you can have two excitatories, a feature and an expectation, and just one inhibitory, so you can begin to select, synchronize, and gain amplify the critical features in an attentional focus as you suppress one against one, one excitatory bottom up against one inhibitory, you suppress irrelevant features. And moreover, <coughs> already in 1999, I knew the laminar circuits that gave rise to object attention, let's say activating a cell in layer six of a higher cortical area would lead to signals to activate layer six in a lower cortical area, which then folded into layer four, where you have a modulatory on center off surround network. So attention acts via a top-down modulatory on center off surround network. And I call this bending from layer six to four folded feedback. Well, this is an example of the paradigm of laminar computing which asks why are all neocortical circuits organized in layers and how do laminar circuits give rise to biological intelligence? Adaptive resonance gets in the story because attended feature clusters reactivate their bottom-up pathways. The activated categories reactivate their top-down pathways therefore closing an excitatory feedback loop and leading to a feature category resonance that synchronizes, amplifies, and prolongs the system response in the attended critical feature pattern and the uh, a correlated category. And it's this resonance state that triggers learning in both the bottom-up adaptive filter and the top-down learned expectations, which is why I call this theory adaptive resonance theory. So in a classification of resonances, feature category resonances support conscious recognition of visual objects and scenes. The same thing is true in audition, but here there are auditory streams, as in the cocktail party problem in stream Shroud resonances support conscious hearing of auditory 
qualia. Well, there's a lot of experimental support for these art predictions. It's known by, from multiple experiments that attention does have an on center off surround characteristic. It's also known that attention can facilitate match bottom up signals and many other supportive data. Well, art is explainable or trustworthy because the critical feature pattern <coughs> determines an attentional focus that controls information processing. And by looking at these features, you know what is driving decision making. The critical feature patterns also determine the adaptive weights that are learned by the bottom-up adaptive filter and the top-down expectation, thereby controlling learned prediction. Moreover, art is reliable. You don't get catastrophic forgetting because the outlier features not in the critical feature pattern are suppressed so that only predictive features are processed and coded. These outliers, which could have caused catastrophic forgetting, are actively inhibited. I mentioned art the production system. How does it do hypothesis testing? <clears throat> Let me illustrate this with the, perhaps the simplest art model called Art 1 that Gail Carpenter and I published in 1987. Here you have an attentional system interacting with an orienting system. And with this circuit, you can get a sense of how the art hypothesis testing and learning cycle works. So first suppose there's a bottom-up vector of <clears throat> input features. I represent it by one pathway, but it's really a vector. And that generates uh, activation of feature detectors, some of them more intense, some quite weak, some not at all. And at the same time this happens, each of these active bottom-up pathways tries to activate the orientic system. But as soon as these features get activated, they try to inhibit the orientic system. And because there's a one-one balance between the number of inputs and the number of active features, the orientic system stays quiet while the feature pattern goes through the adaptive filter, tries to choose a category. The chosen category reads out a learned top-down expectation that obeys the art matching rule to begin hypothesis testing. And if there isn't a very good match, a number of these features can be inactivated, reducing therefore the total inhibition on the orientic system. And the question is, how big a difference between excitation and inhibition can the orienting system tolerate before it fires? And vigilance determines how big a mismatch causes reset. Well, once reset occurs, there's a nonspecific burst of arousal. Novelty is arousing. That shuts off the active category, eliminates its top-down signals, and thereby enables you to instate the original feature pattern and select a different category conditioned on the disconfirmation of the previous category which stays inhibition inhibited for a while. And now this goes on for a while, this search, so that you have a dynamic cycle of resonance and reset. And it's a mathematical theorem that as categories are learned, search automatically disengages, leading to direct access to the globally best matching category. And this explains how you can quickly recognize familiar objects, even as you get older, you know lots more things about the world. So when you see a Ma, you can say, hi Ma, without doing an N over log N search through everything else you know. There's a lot of support for this hypothesis testing cycle for example, from human scalp potentials <clears throat> with Jean-Paul Banquet in the 80s, we showed that you get sequences of P120, N200, and P300 in mismatch uh, events where these correspond to a mismatch triggering nonspecific arousal and reset of the uh, category that's currently coded. 
for a long time also, starting with Bob Desimone's lab. It showed that there is an active matching process that's reset between trials. And this was recorded physiologically in infratemporal cortex, where categories are learned in Desimone's lab. <coughs> it's also known that processing negativity, which is due to top-down matching, and the N200, which is due to this reset and mismatch, have complementary properties, top-down, bottom-up, conditionable, unconditionable, specific, non-specific, match, mismatch. There's beautiful complementary computing in adaptive resonance theory. Where, where complementary computing is another paradigm that I introduced, which explores what's the nature of brain specialization. Complementary computing asserts new principles of uncertainty and complementary that clarify why there are multiple processing streams in the brain with multiple processing stages to realize a kind of hierarchical resolution of uncertainty as this famous macro circuit of the visual system illustrates from the laboratory of David Van Essen. What are complementary properties? Let's start with analogies, a key fitting its lock or puzzle pieces fitting together. Let me state some of its characteristics in words and then illustrate it in greater and greater detail. Computing one set of properties at a processing stage prevents that stage from computing a complementary set of properties. The complementary parallel processing streams are balanced against one another such that interactions between the streams overcome the complementary weaknesses. And I say this with confidence because we now know about quite a few pairs of complementary processes. These are just a few of them. So in summary, backpropagation and deep learning do not have short-term memory activation patterns, short-term memory critical feature patterns, any form of attention or any fast information processing. They don't have long-term memory top-down learned expectations. They don't have hypothesis testing using interacting short-term memory, long-term memory traces. In fact, there's no neural architecture, as we find by contrast in complementary computing. Moreover, Gail Carpenter and I showed in the 80s already how easy it is to get catastrophic forgetting. You don't need a large database to show catastrophic forgetting if the art matching rule doesn't hold. In fact, we showed in any of infinitely many lists of just four input vectors, A, B, C, D, can exhibit catastrophic forgetting if they're repeated cyclically in the order A, B, C, A, D, A, B, C, A, D, and so on. If these uh, input vectors are related by some general subset requirement, D is a subset of C, a subset of A, and so on. And here are a couple of coding examples, A, B, C, A, D, A, B, C, A, D. If you do have the art matching rule, learning is finished by the second trial here. But if you remove the art matching rule, then, for example, um, A is first coded by category one, then by category two, then by category one, then by category two, you have superset recoding in the prototypes of the single pattern A showing catastrophic forgetting. Well, what can we say about vigilance? Vigilance determines what features are learned in the critical feature pattern. It clarifies how brains learn concrete knowledge for some tests and abstract knowledge for others. In particular, high vigilance will learn narrow categories that are also concrete, like a frontal view of your mother's face. Low vigilance will learn broad and abstract categories, like everyone has a face. And it's important to realize that critical feature patterns are explainable at every level of vigilance. Here's an example of just classifying the alphabet at two vigilance levels, a lower 1.5, a higher 1.8. And notice by the time you get to the letter T, there are more categories here 
and they're more concrete than they are here where you only have four categories and they're more abstract. Moreover, vigilance actually occurs in the infratemporal cortex, Desimone's lab again was early to show it, when they contrasted easy versus difficult discriminations with difficult ones required higher vigilance, leading as expected to enhancement of the responses and sharpened selectivity for attended stimuli. You can see how vigilance is computed quite simply. Let's say you have an input vector i that's activating uh, a feature pattern x. Well then that input vector is multiplied by a sensitivity or gain parameter rho on the way to the orientic system. That rho is the vigilance. And then you're gonna subtract the activity pattern uh, from uh, that excitation. And so the total excitation minus the total inhibition is what the orientic system computes. If it's less than zero, the orientic system is inactivated and you can resonate and learn. And if it's greater than zero, the orientic system is activated, which triggers a reset and search for a new category. Well, how do you change vigilance based on predictive success? For that, you need to go from unsupervised to supervised art models, including fuzzy art map, where in addition to having uh, an unsupervised art system processing inputs and an unsupervised art system processing outputs, you have an intermediate map field that associates input categories with object labels, which you can do because of the bi-directional uh, uh, flow of information here. <coughs> And using fuzzy art map, you can learn both many to one and one to many mappings. Well, many to one mappings, which can also be learned by uh, backprop and deep learning, require two stages of compression. For example, let's say you're trying to learn visual categories of multiple letter fonts, uh, different categories will be learned based on the similarity of features let's say you're going to associate it with the name A for the letters A, and then you'll learn an associative map from the visual categories to the auditory categories to say A in response to seeing A. And you could do this with arbitrary kinds of information. It could be a medical database where here the vectors are symptoms, tests, and treatments, and the prediction is, for example, the length of stay in the hospital. Now one to many maps require expert knowledge. Here you're going to be learning many things about uh, this image and let's say um, you've learned that this is a dog so you read out uh, the name dog but now you're going to give the input rover. Well that's a mismatch, it's going to drive a search and you'll learn a new category without unlearning that it's a dog until you have multiple categories that can all characterize your knowledge about Rover leading to a one-to-many map. Moreover, we can ask how do you conjointly minimize predictive error and maximize generalization using error feedback in an incremental fast learning context. <coughs> and here, you can use what we call match tracking to realize a minimax learning principle. Let me read it to you and then um, show it to you in a picture. Given a predictive error, vigilance increases just enough to trigger search and therefore sacrifices the minimum generalization to correct the error. Remember, low vigilance <coughs> implies general categories and the use of less memory. So if you did make a prediction, it must have meant that the analog match between bottom up and top down is greater than the vigilance at that moment. Now, if you have a mismatch, match tracking bumps the vigilance to just above the analog match, the, <coughs> the lowest level of vigilance, 
that can drive a search for a better answer and thereby sacrifices the minimum amount of generalization to correct the predictive error. Or arc mechanisms like vigilance control realized in lamina cortical and thalamic circuits? The answer is yes, as I showed with my PhD student Max Versace in 2008 when we developed the synchronous matching art model or SMART model. Here we had greater uh, neurobiological verisimilitude, we had spiking dynamics, and we had lamina cortical circuits interacting with both specific and non-specific thalamic nuclei. You can uh, see that this is an enhanced analysis of lamina computing, and here is the circuit that Versace and I studied. You can see the layers within each cortex. There are multiple levels of cortex interacting both with specific and non-specific thalamic nuclei, explaining a ton, functionally explaining a ton of very detailed anatomical data. Versace and I also discovered a surprising result if we have a good enough match between bottom and top down, that will increase fast gamma oscillations, which had been reported experimentally. But if you had a big enough mismatch, you could get slower beta oscillations, which wasn't as well known, but since then has been confirmed by studies in at least four labs in both V1, V4, and hippocampus, showing that this gamma beta story has some generality. Moreover, vigilance is controlled by mismatch-mediated acetylcholine release. If there's a big enough mismatch in nonspecific thalamic nucleus, it activates the nucleus basalis of minor, which triggers release of acetylcholine in level five of neocortex, which reduces after hyperpolarization currents, and that is enough to cause an increase in vigilance. So there's cholinergic mediation of vigilance control. Well, let me say a little more about memory consolidation. I pointed out that catastrophic forgetting occurs if top-down expectations fail. Well, what goes wrong if the oriented system fails? And here you could see that amnesia occurs. Normally, there's a dynamic phase of memory consolidation while an input exemplar still drives memory search before you get direct access to the best matching category. But if you cut out the orienting system, which in this case can include the hippocampus, you get a formal amnesic syndrome. You get unlimited anterograde amnesia because without the orienting system, you can't search for new categories. You can get limited retrograde amnesia because you can get direct access to a category without search if you've already consolidated your memory. It's therefore a failure of consolidation. You get defective novelty reactions, including perseveration, because novelty is computed by the ordinary system. And it's been shown that memory consolidation novelty detection are detected by the same structure and here's one of those structures. There's normal priming because priming takes place entirely in the, in the attentional system. Learning can occur, but it's the first item that dominates because you can't search. And in, in like manner, you have an impaired ability to attend to relevant dimensions of stimuli because you can't search to focus attention properly. It's hard to change an established habit because of that. Again, memory consolidation, novel detection, mediated by the same structures. And there's a reduction in novelty related hippocampal potentials of learning proceeds. And as consolidation occurs in the model, you proceed to direct access where you don't need the ordinary system. Moreover, it's been shown there's vigilance control manifested during medial temporal amnesia and this is a story in which trying to model Knowlton and Squires data about amnesia 
uh, Nasevsky and Zaki showed they could do it with a low sensitivity parameter in their, uh, in their uh, algebraic model, but low sensitivity plays a role similar to low vigilance in art, and you get low vigilance if you knock out the Orientic system. Well, all this vigilance data is in the infratemporal cortex, and the infratemporal cortex is just a small part, a category learning object attention part, of what I call predictive art or the part architecture, which I recently published in 2018 to show how prefrontal cortex learns to control all higher order intelligence. And there are regions of the brain, identified regions, where we have detailed models to explain reinforcement learning, emotion, motivation, adaptively timed learning. Others where we've uh, uh, explained working memory, learn planning, prediction and optimize action data, and then also perceptual data. So this kind of highly heterogeneous organization is, uh, shows that each brain region in nature and in predictive art carries out a different function, which is radically different from the homogeneous organization of a typical deep learning network. Deep learning, albeit it can be useful in some applications, has really nothing to do with how our brains work. Well, now let me jump a little to explainable visual percepts. It's known that the functional units of biological vision are completed depth selective boundaries, which gate the filling in of depth selective surfaces, and the boundaries and surfaces are also computationally complementary. Let's look at the boundaries and surfaces. You have depth selective boundaries, which send topographic signals to depth selective surface representations. And also you have <coughs> what's called feature contour inputs. These are um, color or brightness signals where the Illumination has been discounted that are topographically input to different locations in these surface representations. And it's been shown that spatially abutting and collinear boundary contours and feature contours can trigger depth selective filling in of the color in the filling in domain that's satisfied, that's surrounded by a boundary contour. These boundaries and surfaces are explainable by observing their depth selective, spatially distributed representations. Boundaries and surfaces are also computationally complementary. Again, this is the question of complementary computing. And we know that visual boundaries and surfaces are complementary for many years. This is the visual perception part of the figure. Well, what is a visual boundary or grouping? It could be an illusory contour, it could be texture pop-out, it could be 3D shape from texture, it could be figure ground separation. So a boundary is emphatically not just an edge. And the boundaries and surfaces are computationally complementary, as this famous illusion called neon color spreading shows. Look here, you can see a bluish hue within this emergent square, but neither the blue nor the square are in the image, which consists only of these black and blue arcs. This illusion illustrates boundary completion and surface filling in. Notice that the boundaries are completed and oriented in an oriented way inwardly between pairs of greater numbers of induces, whereas the color now, where the black and blue boundaries touch, the black boundary breaks the blue boundary where they meet, where I can't explain today, but color spills out and spreads or fills in, in an unoriented way outwardly. Oriented, unoriented, inward, outward. You begin to see what complementarity means. And this is going on with the boundaries in the interblock cortical stream 
and the surfaces in the blob cortical screen. Well, what about this third property, insensitivity to direction of contrast? What does that mean? Well, that's the difference between seeing versus knowing or seeing versus recognizing. For example, in the case of the Ehrenstein figure, all it is is these blue lines, but you can both see and recognize the emergent circle because of the illusory brightness that's trapped inside. In the case of the offset grading, you can recognize the vertical boundary. It's quite salient, but there's no brightness, color, or depth difference, so you don't see it. So you recognize it, but you don't see it, showing that some boundaries are invisible or amodal. So we can consciously recognize things we don't see. But I actually showed many years ago that all boundaries are invisible in the boundary stream. There are several fundamental reasons for this. One being to be able to recognize object boundaries in front of textured backgrounds. And this is illustrated, for example, with the reverse contrast Knizia square. Here you have a black ray or a dark light contrast grouping with a white ray or a light dark contrast. Opposite polarities can group as can like polarities and the opposite and like polarities all form a, uniform, a unified square. Likewise, if I go around the circumference of the gray disk, I have a gray black that's light dark, a gray white that's dark light, dark light, light dark, dark light, light dark. If we had separate boundary systems for the light darks, there'd be a boundary with big holes in it and color would spill out, likewise for dark lights. But if the light darks and the dark lights are both computed at each location, then you can have a unified boundary around the whole circumference. And this is accomplished at a very early stage in the brain, where in cortical area V1, at each location, pairs of like-oriented simple cells with opposite contrast polarity sensitivities, pool their inputs at the next stage at complex cells, which can therefore respond to both dark light and light dark as we need. So insensitivity or direction of contrast means all boundaries are invisible, so in particular you can form those complete groupings. Well, what does sensitivity direction of contrast mean? Another way of saying it, if boundaries are invisible, how do we see? And this I would contend is due to filling in of surface color where boundaries define the compartments within which lightness and color spread, whether it's the Ehrenstein disk or this Varin version of neon color spreading. The Craig O'Brien corn suite effect is a beautiful classical example of filling in. It looks very innocent. Here you have a uniform dark gray region, a uniform light gray region surrounded by a black border. But something very interesting is going on. I'm going to remove the black border and I want you to pay very close attention. I'll count to three and remove the border. One, two, three. And now you can see that actually the luminance on both sides is identical. And here you can see there's a more luminous cusp and a less luminous cusp, and that's what you report. But as soon as I put on these extra boundaries here and close these rectangular regions, the more luminous cusp <coughs> spreads throughout this region, the less luminous cusp spreads throughout this region, showing us that boundary completion defines the filling in compartments and that filling in determines what we see in each compartment. So sensitivity direction to contrast is talking about filling in a visible color and likeness. It's what we see. Surface perception is where we see conscious visual quality. And so in 84, I was able to assert all boundaries are invisible in the interblob cortical stream, visible quality of surface percepts in the blob cortical stream, and no, no,
contradictory data to this day. So now we can say all conscious states are resonant states and visible quality of surface percepts. But then we need to ask what kind of resonance supports visible surface qualia, or how do we consciously see? And I've been claiming for several years this is due to a surface shroud resonance. So surface shroud resonance support conscious seeing a visible visual qualia. They are explainable because the surface representations are explainable, whereas feature category resonances support conscious recognition of visual objects and scenes. So we have this distinction between seeing and knowing. Well, what is a surface shroud resonance? It's surface fitting spatial attention, which has been called an attentional shroud by a number of investigators. I predicted though that shrouds enable learning of invariant object categories. I can't explain it here, but there are a lot of papers on my webpage you can study if you're interested in that. How a shroud forms is illustrated with this simple example. Let's say you take a cross-sectional area of a simple image where you have a more luminous bar and a slightly less luminous bar. They both send topographic excitatory signals to parietal cortex to try to grab spatial attention while competing for it. But they also send top-down excitatory feedback signals back to the surface representation, creating a recurrent on-center off-surround network that contrast enhances the most actively uh, activated region here, forming a form-fitting shroud via a surface shroud resonance where this excitatory feedback also enhances the perceived contrast of the attended surface as has been reported psychophysically and neurophysiologically. So an active surface shroud resonance means that sustained spatial attention is focused on the object surface. And so we have a seeing um, resonance, a surface shroud resonance going to parietal cortex in the west stream and a knowing feature category resonance going to infratemporal cortex in the watt stream. And their synchronous linkage between the resonances let us uh, know what the object is as we see it. And many data support this prediction. Moreover, if you cut the watt stream knowing resonance, then you get visual agnosia, you can get reaching, you see in order to reach without knowing. Moreover, due to the top-down feedback, this shows how top-down spatial attention and bottom-up intention to reach are both parietal cortical functions. Well, briefly, let me discuss cognitive emotional resonances that support conscious feelings and recognition of them. You can derive them from three basic behavioral competences. We can pay attention quickly to salient events and we do it using the amygdala. But a rapid attention shift could cause a premature response which can cause really bad uh, effects in the wild. But that's eliminated by the second and third competence about adaptive timing. We can adaptively time and maintain motivated attention on a salient event until the response is executed. That needs to hit the campus. And we can adaptively time and execute an appropriate response to the salient event. And that involves the cerebellum. And here is the cognitive emotional motor or Kage model, which illustrates how this happens. You have sensory cortex, in varying object categories, value categories, and amygdala and hypothalamus, object value categories, and orbitofrontal cortex controlling these actions. So conditioned stimulus can activate sensory cortex and then via prior condition reinforcer learning can activate feelings in the amygdala. The amygdala in turn can activate incentive motivational by said incentive motivational learning can enable you to try to pay attention to particular valued objects. 
And here you had converging cues from sensory cortex and amygdala, which is required to fire the orbitofrontal cortex. And it's known that, that this anatomy is in the brain. Here are the sensory cortices. Here's the amygdala. Here's the orbitofrontal cortex. Here are the connections. Classical data from Helen Arbus. Moreover, motivated attention, this top-down loop, closes the cognitive emotional feedback loop. It focuses on relevant cues and causes blocking of irrelevant cues, leading to a cognitive emotional resonance, which is the basis of Damasio's core consciousness. We need to ask, how is the resonance maintained long enough to become conscious? That's due to adaptive lead-time hippocampal support. And all of these representations are, are explainable. <coughs> the selected value categories, the selected uh, uh, sensory data, and so on. Finally, a representation can be explainable without necessarily being conscious, such as, um, uh, such as motor representations, and they're not conscious because the matching and learning laws are not resonance. And here, this is a different complementarity between the what and where stream and the action control through the where stream. So the main point is that spatially variant reaching and movement, where you're continually updating sensory motor maps and gains uses complementary processing to the processing in the Watt stream that we've already discussed with adaptive resonance theory, which gives you a solution to stability and plasticity problem. But here you can have continual change representations as is important as your body changes through life. So whereas you have excitatory matching and match learning in adaptive resonance theory, you have inhibitory matching and mismatch learning in what's called vector associative maps, where target position um, is compared with a present position. This is where you want to go, this is where you are. You subtract where you want to go from where you are. That computes a difference vector, which is then integrated until you are where you want to go, and you get zero, which is an inhibitor. So you have a target position, a present position, a difference vector, a go signal, I'm sorry, go signal, an outflow, movement speed, <coughs> and all of these are explainable just by looking at their representations. Moreover, <coughs> These uh, processing stages in the so-called vector integration to endpoint model, or V, have been measured physiologically. Here's physiological data for motor cortex from the Georgopoulos lab, and here's a, stim a simulation of the difference vector during a reach, very similar shape. There are three S's of movement control that are all very useful. You get synchronous movement, you get synergetic movements that occur synchronously at arbitrary speeds. And you can unlump the VEAT model to reveal finer structure as I did with Dan Bullock, Paul Chizek. Again, you have your target position, your present position, your difference factor, your goal signal, and here the outflow uh, speed is called the desired velocity vector. So, in summary, all these biological models of perception, cognition, emotion, and action are explainable. Perceptual and cognitive processes use art like excitatory matching and match based learning to create self stabilizing, attentive, and conscious representations of objects, events that embody increasing expertise about the world. Complementary spatial and motor processes use inhibitory matching and mismatch-based learning to continually update spatial and motor representations 
to compensate for bodily changes throughout life. Together, they provide a self-stabilizing perceptual and cognitive front end for conscious awareness and knowledge acquisition, which can intelligently manipulate the more labile spatial and motor processes that enable our changing bodies to act effectively in a changing world. Thank you very much for your attention.